Hola a todos y bienvenidos un día más a Momentum 3.0, el lugar donde tomamos nuestras propias decisiones financieras ahora. Hace unos meses grabé una conversación, grabé una entrevista con el CEO de Trustline, con Matthew Rosenden, y hoy quiero compartirla con vosotros haciendo un breve resumen de qué es Trustline. También os recuerdo que nada de lo que comente, de lo que comentemos, constituye asesoramiento financiero ni recomendación directa de compra o de venta, por lo tanto, debéis hacer vuestra propia investigación. Vamos con el vídeo. Trustline es una red descentralizada con una stablecoin, con una moneda estable que sirve para emitir crédito, para emitir moneda. ¿Vale? Vamos a poder transaccionar sin necesidad de gastar nuestras criptos, sin gastar nuestro XRP, sin gastar nuestro FLR, sin gastar en un futuro nuestro Bitcoin también. Por lo tanto, vamos a emitir moneda estable para transaccionar con nuestras cripto. Para ello necesitamos tener XRP, necesitamos tener una bóveda en la que guardemos nuestro dinero y después podamos utilizar Oray, ¿vale? Para enviar ese crédito, para enviar esa moneda estable. También va a estar disponible en Songbird, cosa que cuando grabamos la conversación no sabíamos que iba a estar disponible en Songbird, así que es una actualización muy interesante y obviamente también vamos a poder utilizar el exchange descentralizado de XRP y por lo que me comentó Matthew, también están planteándose si utilizar su propio exchange descentralizado para poder transaccionar entre XRP y cualquiera de las monedas estables que existen en el mercado. Por ejemplo, si queremos transaccionar entre el dólar y el euro, se puede utilizar Oray o se puede utilizar XRP como moneda puente. Muy interesante en ese sentido, ya que actualmente es difícil encontrar mucho volumen de negociación entre el euro y la libra con respecto, por ejemplo, al euro dólar o con respecto al euro yen. Es un tema que debemos tener presente. Es más cuantitativo que de lógica pura, entonces no es tan fácil. Sin embargo, vamos a profundizar un poquito más y vamos a entender cómo se desarrolla todo lo que he comentado. Tenemos una aplicación que se está desarrollando y que va a estar disponible de momento en testnet y en pruebas. Esto quiere decir que no está comercialmente disponible, sin embargo podemos participar en la beta, en la fase de pruebas. Dicho esto, vamos a tener varias conversaciones con varias actualizaciones. Personalmente soy muy fan de solo hablar de lo que ya está construido y es cierto que la beta de la aplicación ya está construida. El coste es muy bajo, en torno a un 1 un, partido 100, es decir, un céntimo de centavo. Y por supuesto, esto es gracias al sistema que tenemos en XRP y que vamos a tener en Flare. Los APRs, es decir, los costes de endeudamiento van a ser tan bajos como un 1%, así que vamos a poder obtener loans, vamos a poder obtener préstamos muy asequibles, muy affordable. Por lo tanto, hay que estar muy pendiente de esta aplicación, de esta oportunidad, ya que también va a haber liquidity mining, va a haber una distribución justa, no se va a hacer una ICO en principio, por lo que me ha comentado Matthew, así que mucho más sencillo para todos. Hasta aquí la introducción, si os queréis quedar al vídeo, perfecto, y si os queréis quedar solo con la introducción, no hay ningún problema. También decidme en los comentarios si os gustaría que tradujéramos estos vídeos para tenerlos también disponibles en castellano. Un abrazo a todos, os recuerdo que nada de lo que comentemos constituye asesoramiento financiero ni consejo de inversión, por lo tanto, debéis hacer vuestra propia investigación. Y sin más, vamos con el vídeo. Hello and welcome to Momentum 3.0. Here we are with the CEO of Trustline. And we will be talking about Trustline, also about Flare, XRP, and things like that. So let's start with the first question of today, the most important question of today, that is, 
How are you doing today, my man? Thank you for the question. Uh, I'm doing pretty well. It's uh, nice and uh, early here on the Pacific coast and uh, I'm always excited to chat about DeFi. Wonderful, wonderful. So let's start with what is Strathline? Um, in a nutshell, we want a small, a brief explanation, please. Sure. Uh, so at a high level, what Trustline is uh, trying to accomplish here is to build out a credit network uh, that is, you know, native to uh, the blockchain, um, utilizing cryptocurrencies, um, building a credit network that uh, is more, perhaps more stable than what we have today. Uh, where banks are underwriting credit and um, you have uh, situations like the 2008 financial crisis happening. Uh, so the idea here is to build something that um, will, will uh, prevent, prevent uh, such situations from arising. And uh, where I think that really starts is um, with creating a, you know, credit on the blockchain uh, that uh, is, you know, fully backed starting there and uh, being able to issue that credit. Um, mm -hmm. So I would say just at a high level, it's a credit network. Nice, nice. Um, which network, which blockchain did you choose? Uh, why? Because I heard that it is built on player networks but as their networks also uses XRPL, I would like to hear from you, which network are you going to use or if you are going to use both or can you explain that please? Sure, uh, so yeah, the idea is to uh, leverage both networks. Um, so using Flare for the smart contract capabilities um, that allows us to run DeFi applications and Flare has the F assets. So that allows you to connect uh, value uh, from other blockchains such as the XRP ledger um, onto the Flare network and unlock that value um, in DeFi applications. So uh, I am using uh, the XRP ledger uh, for a couple of reasons. So uh, the XRP uh, asset is uh, pretty mature um, in the marketplace uh, and the XRP ledger is incredibly fast and uh, inefficient if you're doing uh, payments. So, uh, uh, you know, with Flare, you have the ability to transfer that value um, from the, you know, XRP ledger to the Turing complete uh, uh, Flare uh, EVM, where you can do things that you can't do on the XRP ledger. Um, but then you can also transfer that value back to the XRP ledger. Um, and you can uh, utilize that value uh, that's, you know, um, in, in a, a DeFi uh, context, but using it on the XRP ledger. Um, and so essentially uh, where I'm going with that is um, using that value on the XRP ledger uh, in order to, you know, make payments uh, and, uh, and do so with, you know, quick transfers uh, of payment and uh, at a very low cost. Nice, nice. Um, let's talk about those smart contracts like... Uh, the, the main goal of some projects is to build that stable coin and yours is Aura, isn't it? So That's right. Yeah. Can you explain that? And can you explain which stable coin style do you follow? Because there are some, and we want to hear from you, which one are you using? Sure. Uh, so there are a couple of different types of stable coins. Uh, the most popular 
are fiat collateralized stable coins such as uh, Tether uh, or USDC. So these stable coins uh, are fully backed one-to-one -one by uh, like the PEG currency. So in this case, the US dollar backed one-to-one -one by uh, US dollar reserves held in a bank account. So um, uh, that's a fiat collateralized stable coin. Um, and then on the other hand, you have the crypto collateralized stable coins, uh, which are uh, also backed, uh, but instead of being backed by a fiat currency, it's backed by a cryptocurrency or set of cryptocurrencies. And it's over collateralized um, in case the price of the collateral goes down, then um, it retains its peg. Um, so a uh, couple of uh, things that differentiate these two stable coins is that uh, auditability and transparency is a big, big difference there. Um, you can always verify, uh, you know, the, that the, the funds backing a crypto collateralized stable coin are there backing it. Um, you can't do that with a fiat stable coin. Uh, that uh, bank account balance that's doing the backing is private and um, uh, auditors have to uh, basically verify that the funds are there. And so you actually see like with Tether, for example, there's a, a like allegation that um, they weren't fully backing the Tether currency by one-to-one -one with with reserves um, and so that was a bit of a controversy um, so that's not really an issue with a crypto stable coin okay and um, what is your plan about the collateral can you can we use xrp can we use spark or what is what is your roadmap your plan yeah so uh I'm, I'm doing some testing right now, uh, starting with Spark, um, but I have it next on my uh, list of things to do to, once I have Spark collateral working, then move on to the F assets, uh, starting with FXRP. So uh, that I think is critical, um, you know, uh, to provide, you know, uh, F asset or FXRP as collateral because, again, uh, it's a more mature asset and um, uh, it'll help keep the peg uh, probably a bit better and therefore better stable currency. Nice. And what about F dot? Do you have it <laughs> in your plan or not? <laughs> um, well, uh, I suppose it could be possible if somebody wanted to do that, maybe there would be a way, but um, probably wouldn't be for uh, the, the best of uh, the, of ORE. Um, so, you know, that's one of the key things is how are the collateral assets determined? Um, you see with other projects, this is a process involved with governance um, so governance is uh, pretty key. And uh, so that's also something that is very important for ORE. Um, but the goal is also to uh, minimize the amount of governance as much as possible. Um, I believe that governance itself can be somewhat of a, a central point of failure um, if uh, not done correctly. and um, and the possibility of it, uh, bad governance is always going to be there if there's governance. So, um, minimizing governance as much as possible is probably the, um, best thing to do. And that's what I hope to achieve. Uh, but with the early stages here, um, uh, I'm, uh, taking it slowly and, uh, we'll, we'll see it develop from there. Nice. I have an institution working on Kava. 
we are uh, working with the protocol, so uh, it's familiar for us. Um, are you taking those projects as a uh, reference, like Maker, Compound, Kava? Uh, what, is, what is your opinion about uh, the flaws or the advantages that, that they have? Because, for example, Kava already uses XRP in, in this case, XRPP. So what is your position about, about this? Yeah, I, uh, I'm a big fan of a lot of these protocols. Uh, so Compound, MakerDAO, Aave, uh, Lending Protocol. Um, and then there are others uh, that I am referencing. So there's a lot of aspects to these projects that they do a couple of things really well. And then there are some things that um, they are achieving that uh, aren't necessarily what uh, a stable coin should be uh, trying to achieve. So um, the kind of difference uh, is that, and also I wanted to add a uh, Uniswap is actually something that um, I'm looking at very closely right now. Uh, they have this concept of automated market maker, um, which has become very popular. So Uniswap is now um, the you know, biggest decentralized exchange uh, in the Ethereum ecosystem. So um, this AMM, uh, as it's called, uh, uh, methodology is uh, pretty interesting. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm combining a, that part um, with uh, different components of these other protocols uh, and uh, ultimately to achieve uh, a way to deposit cryptocurrency um, and receive loans from this, you know, decentralized autonomous bank on the blockchain. Nice, nice. For example, one big, big problem that we have currently is the liquidation price. Um, I think that automated market making could solve this. Like, if we are close to the um, to the liquidation price, we may uh, uh, automatically swap some of our. XRP or uh, Spark collateral into the stable coin or whatever, because that was the big, big problem, the Black Swan event with MakerDAO. So I personally feel that that is the, the key right now for the kind of project that you are developing. Um, for example, in Kava, they they are also trying to to do it. Um, yeah, I think that we need that kind of uh, AMM with stable coins. Um, let's talk about the project, the white paper that I uh, have been reading about. Um, the main question here is the credit worthiness. How can we achieve this? credit worthiness or how can we measure that? I am economist, so I need to measure this kind of things. How can you measure that? Uh, so if I'm understanding the question correctly, uh, we want to understand, you know, how we can um, measure, you know, parts of the system, um, you know, it's on the blockchain. Um, uh, all of the, you know, parameters are visible to everyone. So you can get an idea of the sort of risk uh, in the system at any point in time. So I think it's a lot of the time more useful to think of things in terms of risk. Um, and in a stable coin system, uh, you want to look at the collateralization level. Um, so, you know, uh, there's like a you know, uh, a total total aggregate balance of, you know, outstanding debt. Um, 
So you can see, uh, you know, what is the collateral that is securing these loans at an aggregate level? And uh, what is the ratio of this collateral to um, the, the basically the peg? So, you know, what is the collateralization ratio? Is it healthy um, or not? So you want to look at that from the perspective of the borrower, but also from the people who are providing the liquidity to create that or a uh, stable coin uh, liquidity pool, which is uh, what allows people to borrow this asset. So um, yeah, I think it's uh, uh, very important uh, for, for that, uh, those uh, collateralization levels to be healthy. Um, and I think ultimately that's what will fuel the growth of, uh, of uh, or a uh, trust uh, in, in the system uh, that in the sense that um, you have a healthy system and that it has room to grow and expand. Um, obviously, like during a bull market, that will uh, allow it to prosper. Uh, whereas uh, in uh, you know, a downturn in the crypto economy, of course we'll see contraction, but um, you know, this is, it's, it's all also based on supply and demand too. So, um, but ultimately, you know, this, the, the most important thing is to keep the peg for, for a stable coin. And what are the incentives to achieve that goal? How can we achieve the one-to-one -one ratio with incentives here? Right. So uh, probably the most important incentive, uh, I, I believe, is, um, you know, the, the opportunity cost of uh of money so you know i know you like to uh you, you mentioned you like to talk economics i also love to talk economics too um so with this opportunity cost uh there's always you know some sort of cost of handling any sort of money um and in this case you have you know fiat um and uh crypto and if you have uh, money in crypto, uh, then, you know, you can, you know, you, you obviously you have it in there uh, for a reason. So in, in crypto, that is because maybe you expect the price to appreciate. Um, and uh, more so than uh, what you can in getting uh, higher returns than you can with a uh, fiat currency. So uh, that's an opportunity cost, but also, um, you know, using uh, crypto itself in order to get that yield um, is uh, an incentive to provide liquidity to the system. Um, and then, uh, so that yield and the interest rate that uh, borrowers are uh, charged is uh, pretty closely related, right? So um, you have this interest rate, when the rates are low, you have more demand for borrowing. Um, when the rates are high, you have the incentives for people to provide um, or a liquidity. Um, and and uh, I think that uh, what's key here is that the market kind of like decides where that interest rate sits um, with regard to ORE. Okay, um, um, yeah, yeah. And real quick, I, I just wanted to mention that there are other uh, incentive schemes, um, uh, you know, involving uh, the stability of the system. So for example, um, the governance token or trust line credit network token um, playing a similar role to MakerDAO as well. But the main, uh, incentive here is the uh, just the ability to earn yields um, and and benefit from the system um, by participating in it. Okay, 
Um, let's talk about those uh, tokenomics, those uh, quantitative and qualitative uh, incentives with the, the token, because are you planning to have inflation or deflationary system? What is, what is your position about that? Yeah, so uh, this is a good question because um, how how that actually works out in practice, uh, there's the, the monetary policy of ORE is uh, dictated by uh, participants. So again, that's people who are providing ORE liquidity. So these are people who I call shareholders or equity holders in the system. Mm -hmm. um, they uh, provide a form of collateral that uh, allows RA to be minted um, and held in reserves. And then um, that uh, the RA reserves basically, it's like a bank, right? You can then uh, issue a loan asset with those reserves. And, uh, and everyone who owns uh, equity share in the system uh, reaps the reward based on uh, uh, payments, repayments of debt that is created through uh, probity. So, and probity is uh, the smart contract system that is facilitating uh, basically everything happening in the system, um, you know, primarily like this lending activity. Um, so, uh, so is there inflation or deflation? Well, what I can tell you is that there's definitely, um, you know, the amount of ORA in circulation will change based on uh, how much liquidity people are providing. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, also how much demand there is. So, um, you know, you see kind of like this interest rate that's gonna float around um, in order to uh, kind of come to like an equilibrium of supply and demand between, um, you know, involving the amount of ore that's in the system. And so um, you expect it to work just like uh, your regular supply and demand for loanable funds, you know, this, this model in economics. Uh, in, in the sense that you know, uh, these two these two curves of supply and demand will uh, influence like what is the cost of you know taking out this loan, uh, or what is the, the the yield that I can get by providing liquidity to the system. Nice, and the governance token will be distributed or. Can we just get it from the rewards that we have been talking about? How can we get that token? Yeah, uh, this is uh, still um, a lot to be, uh, you know, determined and um, shared at a later time. But um, I can tell you that. Uh, how it's going to be distributed is directly related to participation in the network. So um, the goal with the governance token is to incentivize participation, incentivize uh, people who are good actors, uh, doing things in good faith, um, helping to grow, uh, the, the ecosystem um, and these are the people who should have a say in how the system works. Nice, nice. So if you want, you can come when, whenever you want to, to the channel. We keep in, in contact because as the player network is planned to launch on May, June, or even July. I hope that in, before before July we, we have it. What is your roadmap related to, to those 
to those figures, to those uh, dates? Yeah, uh, so uh, the roadmap is, um, I would say it's pretty aggressive. Uh, so planning to get something out there as soon as possible for testing to commence. Um, I think it's important for people uh, mm -hmm. to get familiarity with it. Um, and uh, also just general testing, you know, figure out if there's any bugs, um, run a bug bounty program. Um, there's gonna be audits. So that's actually uh, the main uh, uh, blocker here is that uh, these teams who are performing audits are uh, quite busy. So um, I expect that uh, the first audit will be taking place uh, at least uh, two months from now. So, um, you know, uh, you can expect something on the test net, uh, maybe a month to six weeks from now, uh, hopefully. And uh, uh, main net launch following those audits. Uh, I think it's quite important that we have a stable foundation that's secure audited and ready to, uh, you know, perform on the main net for, uh, with everyone, you know, uh, assured that it's ready to perform. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. This kind of uh, projects that let us build over the project are quite quite chaotic because we we have tons of ideas of how can we build over for example the xrpl and tons of us think about the xrp and even flare as well i can start a social media platform and i can uh, teach people about this i started my channel thanks to flare because of the tutorial of how to get those spark um yeah things like that so yeah i think that we we can see those projects as uh, things that logically may be replicated into flare like you have maker you will have something related to that in in the product in the new uh, network and this is more or less like the logical reasons. But just to finish the conversation, why did you start the, the project? What was your why? Uh, well, first of all, it's really great that you're um, creating this channel and uh, helping to uh, you know spread information about Flare, which is a really great project that I'm just so excited to see um, as you are uh, to come to fruition. Um, so why did I start this project? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I think uh, there are some personal reasons, uh, but um, also just generally because I feel there's um, you know a huge need for for something like this. Um, there's just too many people who don't actually have uh, what, what a lot of us take for granted, um, which is this credit system um, where people are excluded. And so um, I think ultimately if the vision can be realized, um, it's, 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 a, it's a project that can bring a net benefit and value to the world. That is what's really driving me is, um, you know, the ability to improve the state of the world in some way. And uh, I think DeFi is the, uh, the right vehicle um, for me to do that uh, coming from my background. Um, and, uh, and it's just really, really exciting. So, um, I'm having a lot of fun doing it too. 
Uh, so that's also a huge driver. Nice, nice. So we can have a second round later, maybe after the launch or uh, weeks, months before the launch of the, the app in order to gain momentum as the channel is called, a uh, gain momentum for you to, to have the support from, from us because we are mainly from Spain, but also from Mexico. Tons of people in the channel from Mexico, from Colombia, from Argentina. So they see the Euro dollar as uh, we see the Euro, like uh, something more or less stable or really stable compared to their local currencies. So they may be more interested in the app than we are in Spain, because as you can imagine here in Spain, we have the Euro and it's, it's our main currency. We use dollars for some issues, but not as much as people from the US. We also have people from the US and also people from uh, America, from uh, Latin America. Okay. So it was a pleasure to talk with you about these things. Um, yeah, you, you are invited to the next one. Well, uh, thank you so much. It was really a pleasure. Um, you know, speaking with you, and uh, I would absolutely be delighted to come back. So thank you.